We're going to go through this learning outcome just on this page here. There's a lot of definitions. I want you to try to make sense of these words because they will make a lot more sense. Um, so hyper, right, is high hyperventilation. This is a high rate of breathing, of ventilation. I'm going to say specifically because that's, that's what breathing is. Um, respiration can mean other things, right, of, of breathing. Hypoventilation is the opposite, so a low rate of breathing. Yopnea, her different ways of pronouncing this, um, is quiet breathing. So it's what you're doing at rest. It's going to use those inspiratory muscles, um, the external intercostals and the diaphragm that are the ones used with quiet breathing. Um, Yupnia is what's going to use those. And this is going to give you a tidal volume of 500 milliliters. So that's the amount that's inhaled and exhaled at yupnia when you're, um, and that's all review, right? This stuff, this is the new term. Hypernia, that maybe you can do a guess based on this. This is going to be increased breathing, kind of generally, this is going to be force. So increased force. I'm going to contrast this to hyperventilation in just a moment, because that's probably the two that you're like, those seem similar, right? One more, and then we'll do that. Apnea is a stopping or cessation. Cess. That doesn't seem right. Of breathing. You may have heard of sleep apnea. So that's the most common time this can happen um, because when you're awake, you kind of um, are aware that you're not breathing and can regulate that. When you're sleeping, breathing is controlled by um, central and peripheral chemoreceptors that are constantly signaling to your, your medulla to trigger those external intercostals and diaphragm muscles to keep contracting. Right. If those, there can either be central or, or peripheral um, apnea as a cause that results in a stopping of that signal. Um, and so this can be, this is sleep apnea. Okay. So let's compare hyperventilation to um, hypernia. Hypernia is um, increased due to metabolic demands. So exercise, right? Great example. Increased force and depth and rate of breathing um, as you exercise. Other examples too. This is an adaptive response that keeps your, all your levels, PCO2, um, PO2, pH, all maintained. And I'll talk about changes in these during exercise and also a lack of change. They don't change a whole lot during exercise because they're, they're regulated variables. Um, and that's due to, right, you have increased metabolism, increased production of carbon dioxide, increased utilization of oxygen, oxygen but you're also breathing constantly to maintain that, um, those levels how you want them to be. In this process, you would have those accessory muscles of the abdomen and neck um, involved in breathing. So that's in contrast to hyperventilation, which if you, you know, kind of think of that word, it's not a good thing when it happens. It's not really an adaptive response. This can be triggered by anxiety sometimes. Um, and what it's going to do, it's increased rate of breathing, but often results in exhalation more. So you're exhaling more than you're inhaling, which seems like maybe that's a good thing, but it's actually not. Um, so both the increased rate and depth are both increasing here. 
such that you are removing more, what do you think, CO2 than normal. We want to get rid of CO2, right? But we also actually want to maintain PCO2 within a normal range. Um, so if you remove too much CO2, it's called hypocapnia. This um, results in various symptoms, including dizziness, um, muscle spasms, tingling, fainting, um, and this is also partly due to a rise in pH, right? Low PCO2 is going to cause an increase in pH. This is called, this is actually called respiratory alkalosis. Um, and we may talk about this a little bit more when we get to pH acid base regulation, which is a different chapter of the book. <laughs> respiratory system is very important for maintaining pH, especially quickly. So if you, have, if you are hyperventilating, one common cure you may have seen for this, a way to deal with this is a brown paper bag that is put over the mouth and then you're rebreathing um, that same air, right? So here's a brown paper bag. The air that you're blowing, breathing into it is very high carbon dioxide. Um, relatively speaking, you're breathing that back in again because you are hypo, you have hypocapnia. This is actually not recommended much anymore. Um, that's partially because the symptoms of hyperventilation can overlap with asthma and other lung disorders where you would not want to be rebreathing. So this is not always advised for the general public to do. If you do do this, like 10 breaths, um, and the main thing is to do sh short, shallow breaths instead of deep breaths, which is kind of maybe also counterintuitive. Okay, so do we know why we could hold one's breath longer after hyperventilating than after normal breathing? That's what this is saying right here. Well, it's because we have that low CO2. If you do have that low CO2 to start with and you hold your breath, you're gonna be able to hold your breath for longer um, because you are starting at a lower PCO2. Um, so this is something that's done before people like take deep dives is really deep breaths, trying to lower that PCO2 to some extent, not it to go into respiratory alkalosis.